This is a short guide to signal flow through an analogue desk in a studio environment, from microphone to monitors and meters. Using the MTA 980 desk, situated in Perth College UHI's East Lake 3 studio. The sound source is going to be this radio, set up in the live room with an AKG C414 condenser microphone. The signal travels down through the balanced XLR cable and into the wall box in the live room. It's plugged into channel 5 in order to show the capabilities of the routing matrix on the desk. When it enters the desk, the signal is amplified by the channel's preamp from mic level to line level, controlled with the gain pot, before continuing into the routing matrix. The routing matrix is used to determine which output the signal is to be sent to after it has passed through the channel strip. Because we intend to record on channel 1 in Pro Tools, we're going to select the button marked 1 and 2. After moving through the routing matrix and preamp, it then moves through the EQ, or equalisation section. Here, specific frequencies can be targeted and either attenuated or boosted giving greater control over the tone of what you're recording. This is followed by the auxiliary section, where a copy of the signal can be sent to different places by using the patch bay. The channel pan is next, along with an individual channel mute button, after fade and pre-fade listen buttons, and solo button. Finally is the channel fader. This determines how much signal is to be sent through the output to Pro Tools. The channel pan is turned to the left to indicate that we want to use channel 1. If we wanted to use channel 2, we would pan it to the right. Because we're using a condenser microphone, it requires phantom power. So we're going to make use of the button that's labelled plus 48 volts, sending a small voltage to the microphone while the desk is still muted to avoid any signal spikes. The channel fader is moved to the unity gain position at 0 dB to ensure that the cleanest possible signal is sent to Pro Tools. The desk is unmuted using the master mute and auto mute master buttons. Before using the mic gain pot to set the input level to your channel in Pro Tools. Aiming for a healthy signal of minus 10 to minus 12 dB to ensure that you have plenty of headroom for applying dynamics and effect processing. In order for Pro Tools to understand the signal coming from the analog desk, it passes through an ADDA converter, which stands for analog to digital, digital to analog. It converts an audio signal into binary code comprised of ones and zeros for the computer to understand. After selecting our choice of monitor and giving it a slight bit of gain, the signal passes back through the ADDA converter from Pro Tools and we can control the volume of what we're listening to by using the monitor fader. The VU meters on the desk meter the signal level coming back from Pro Tools on the monitor path. The monitors we're using are a pair of Yamaha NS10Ms. To set up a headphone mix, in order to allow musicians to hear what's being played, a connection on the patch bay is made between auxiliaries 5 and 6 and QAMP 3 left and right. A set of headphones are then plugged into a box with jack outputs. This is then plugged into the QAMP output on the wall box. The auxiliary masters are unmuted and a small amount of gain applied. We can now send the desired amount of signal coming through channel 5 through the channel's auxiliary section by using the auxiliary pot labelled 5 and 6. Place the headphones up at the mic, 
and you should be able to hear what's coming through. We can now set up a talkback mix to allow us to speak to the musicians in the live room by adjusting the talkback level pot and pressing the auxiliary 5 and 6 button. This will dim any signal currently going through the auxiliary send and give the talkback mic priority. In order to place a compressor on the channel, we connect the insert send to the Behringer 2000 input left. We then connect the output left from the Behringer 2000 back to the channel insert return. This will send the entire signal to the desired processing unit. In this case, a Behringer Composer 2000 compressor gate and limiter. And um, when we came out of the studio, um, we were looking on our phones, and we saw reports of the Paris To add a reverb unit, we're going to send a copy of the signal from Auxiliary 1 by patching Auxiliary 1 send to the Yamaha SPX90 input. The stereo output from the SPX90 is then going to be patched back in to Echo Return or Effect Return 5 and 6. This gives us a wet reverb signal that we can mix in with the dry signal from Channel 5 by using the Echo Return faders. The LED meters on the desk indicate how much signal you're sending through the auxiliaries. In an analogue studio setting, there are a few points to take into consideration. The RT60 time, defined by the length of time it takes for the signal to drop by 60 decibels. For a studio control room, this should be between 0.2 and 0.5 seconds. There are a number of treatments you can apply to your studio to ensure you're within the optimal RT60 time, such as ensuring there are no parallel walls, floors, ceilings or other surfaces such as doors or windows, choosing acoustically absorbent materials for your walls, ceilings and floors, and the placement of diffusers and bass traps to deal with any problem frequencies. Analog equipment has been seeing a resurgence in popularity in recent years, but there are a few things you should take into consideration when deciding whether to arrange your studio as a digital or analog setup. In comparison to digital desks, analog equipment is relatively expensive and requires much more maintenance. However, individual components can often be removed to be repaired or replaced, something that's not possible with digital desks. For some of the older analogue desks, it is now becoming much more difficult to acquire replacement parts. Because of the lack of physical components, digital desks can often be much more compact and easier to move around. And consequently, they're not as heavy. Although in a studio setting, once the desk is installed, this isn't an issue. It's more applicable for live sound. It is often claimed that analogue equipment has a warmer and more superior sound, although digital equipment in recent years has begun to catch up. In comparison to a digital desk, an analogue desk can handle a higher level of signal being put through it, without clipping or distorting. Once you've recorded a clipped signal, there is nothing you can do to get rid of it, and re-recording is the only option. And lastly, one thing many people like about an analogue setup is the ability to see at a glance exactly what's going on with the desk. With a digital desk, often a lot of the patches can only be seen through a computer screen. <laughs> 